few players, JJ, Martin, Lockie Hunter, you know, in and out of the team. Melbourne was similar as well. Is that just normal round one preparation to, you know, be uncertain, I guess, at how you're going to prepare? You've got the nerve to ask me a question and even be here. Is that the way Fox want you to oper operate? Yeah, is that I'm what you're doing? Is that the gutter journalist you want to be? No. Is that, is that who you want to be? Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And as far as dummy spits go, that was 10 out of 10. A spectacular three-minute meltdown by Western Bulldogs coach Luke Beveridge during the first post-match press conference of the AFL season. And the trigger? This yarn by Fox Footy's Tom Morris two days earlier. Big news tonight as we go to where Lockie Hunter has been dropped Jeez. for Wednesday night's game against Melbourne. He's not injured, it's not disciplinary, they've simply left him out. That selection tip via a Bulldogs leak was pretty innocuous, but it was enough to make the Bulldogs coach unleash on Morris for undermining the club. Your gutter journalism at the moment is killing our, us and behind the scenes. Do you cause all this uh, muckraking trash that happens behind the scenes? Gutter journalist and muckraker for a guy just doing his job. With Beveridge then asking Morris... Are you proud of yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're proud of yourself? Yeah, Fox backs me. Wow. Well, and to be honest... They? To be honest... They? No, no, selection. that's enough. That's enough. Next question, please. But it wasn't enough because Beveridge then changed his mind and came back for more. Mate, you're not welcome. No, no, this is the AFL's press conference and I'll it's sit what? here. It's the what? It's the AFL's press conference. Yeah, OK. Well, well I think you've got enough boys and girls. Yeah, you're an embarrassment to what you do, mate. You're an embarrassment. And with that, the coach was gone, leaving footy commentators on Fox 7 and 9 all stunned at his public outburst. Like I just could not believe what I was seeing. That is uh, one of the oh. extraordinary things that I've seen uh, in wow. from an interaction perspective between a coach and a journalist. Uh, Tom Morris deserves a massive apology from Luke Beveridge. It's not gutter journalism, it's good journalism. And veteran age footy writer Caroline Wilson was also furious. And he's brought the game into disrepute. I think it should be a six-figure fine myself. I've never seen anything so disgraceful in all my years of covering football. Quite a scorecard, and one the coach addressed only a day after his tanty with a two-minute apology. My exchange with journalist Tom Morris overstepped the mark. I want to apologise for my behaviour. I want to apologise to Tom Morris and all those present last night. So, game over, news cycle complete. Not quite, because shortly after the coach's apology came this breaking news. And there's been a shock twist involving the reporter at the centre of the scandal. Yes, a twist it certainly was, with the Herald Sun reporting... Fox footy reporter Tom Morris stood down after offensive video and audio leaked. In the clips, Morris can be heard making a series of derogatory comments about a female colleague and disparaging women, Asians, black people and homosexuals. So, from hero to zero in less than two days, thanks to audio from a private WhatsApp group leaked out onto Twitter, YouTube, Instagram and a Facebook group for Western Bulldogs fans, including this voice recording of Morris, making lewd and sexist comments about a female colleague. Fucking hot as, and a great bird, like, good fun, good to talk to, like, my view, the hottest girl at Fox by a long way. But, unfortunately, Believe me, it got much worse than that. And within 24 hours, Morris had been sacked, thus ending 15 minutes of fame that he could certainly have done without. Morris has since issued a statement to say... I would like to unconditionally apologise for my disgusting and disgraceful comments. I am deeply ashamed at my behaviour. And he has vowed to become a better person. But now, the great dating swindle and the red flags for lovers and the media. You can find a bit of everything on Tinder, but one little swipe can change your life. I only miss you when it rains. Immediately, we had a bond. He needs our cash. $20,000, $30,000. $140,000. Oh, That's when police tell me. The man I love was never real. Everything's a lie. The Tinder swindler, a doco on Israeli con man Simon Leviev and the women he fleeced through the dating app, was a global smash hit for Netflix last month. London-based Norwegian Cecilia Fjellhoy was one of three women who told her story of deceit and despair, and recently she's been busy retelling the tale as a warning to others. How much money did he con from you? It's over £200,000 now, and he's in high-interest loans that are still accumulating. 
I wasn't I wasn't ashamed because I knew what I'd been through and I knew that it, it was horrifying. You kind of can't comprehend that the person you met was never your boyfriend, all the loving moments you had with him. So when Cecilia put up her hand for a chat to an Australian audience, the briefing jumped at the chance. The popular daily news podcast, produced by audio giants Southern Cross Australia, made Cecilia their feature interview on 11th of March, with Katrina Blowers taking the call. 33-year-old Cecilia Fielhoy is one of Leviev's victims. She was even thinking about moving in with him. And she joins us from Norway now. He looked pretty good on his Instagram, didn't he? Yeah, he does. And that's what got me attracted to him because he's, he, he's my type. For 10 minutes, Blouse teased out Cecilia's heartbreak and how she's putting her life back together. I felt really, really disgusted. I felt like train up. I felt horrible and sad because I don't know how someone could be this evil and horrible. I'm still trying to pay my debts back <laughs> and trying to start up my foundation and um, also no love right now, but if love comes, I'm going to hug it and I still want love. Blowers threw in her own stories of dating app disasters and after thanking her guest, ended with this message for the audience. And I guess the takeaway here is Listen to your gut, ladies and men. <laughs> Cecilia wishes that she had seen those red flags sooner. Listen to your gut and look for red flags in dating and in journalism. As you may have noticed, Cecilia on the briefing sounded absolutely nothing like the real Cecilia, who sounds like this. The victim blaming and shaming mm. that we really wanted to be able to talk about. And when the real Cecilia was tagged on the briefing's Instagram page, she responded with the obvious question. That is not my voice. What is going on here? We don't know if that's the first hint the briefing had that they themselves had been swindled. But we do know that two days later, Blowers was back on air with this important update. We wanted to let you all know that we had to take down our Friday episode of The Briefing. If you didn't hear it, that was the interview about the Netflix series with one of the victims, or at least so we thought. So they thought, as host Tom Tilly, a former Triple J presenter, then explained... Turns out the person Katrina interviewed wasn't the real Cecile. And yes, we do realise the irony of this. Someone was impersonating her... And our suspicion is that this imposter was trying to profit from the story, either through fake fundraising or paid media interviews. She asked us to pay her, um, but we refused that offer. And now that episode has been taken down. Bit of a wild one there. Wild is one way to describe it. An embarrassing cock-up is another. Cecilia tells us, and yes, we checked, that the scammer took words straight out of her mouth. I can see from the start that she's been listening to my interviews and taken things I've said and reused it. It seems the briefing producers set up the chat with a PR agency purporting to work for Netflix. And that agency is also a fake. So who is the imposter? Why on earth did they do it? And why didn't anyone on the show twig that the accent of the woman they were talking to was about as far away from Norwegian as you can get? A Southern Cross Australia spokesperson told us they are still investigating how it happened. How very embarrassing. You really could not make it up. And now to South Australia, but not to the election and Labor's big victory, but to a regional paper where it seems all the news is good. Jobs grow on trees. That front page splash in community newspaper The SE Voice last month was music to the ears of residents on the Limestone Coast, with its announcement of a multi-million dollar investment in the forestry sector by the federal government. So what's the problem? Well, you'll be shocked to hear that this front page scoop was a direct lift of a press release on Coalition MP Tony Passin's website. The, the Morrison government, government, government will invest more than $86 million over five years to support the establishment of new plantations in the Green Triangle. There are 253 words in the newspaper article and 252 of them came from the press release. And what did the paper change? It substituted the word federal for Morrison in the first paragraph. And if that shameless copying wasn't bad enough, the SE voice then added the editor's byline to the story. It is a pathetic effort from a newspaper that promises to give the region its own voice and charges customers $2 per copy. So, is it a rogue example in an otherwise outstanding paper? Sadly not. In the same week, the SE voice served up another front page story with the editor's byline, which followed the same pattern copying large chunks of text from Tony Passon's press release and giving the local MP a big thumbs up for his hard work in Canberra. 
Mr. Passon has been actively advocating for increased mental health services for the Limestone Coast amongst his federal coalition colleagues in Canberra. Appalling, eh? And sad to say, the SE Voice is not the only regional paper into recycling. Two weeks ago, Victoria's Mildura Weekly ran this glowing story about local farmers benefiting from the federal government's drought fund. And guess where that came from? Copied almost word for word from local MP and Webster's press release, with a picture added from the MP's Facebook page. And there's other examples at the Mildura Weekly, as ABC journalist Bensian Siebert found when he investigated the issue. Like this story about the government's $5 million cash injection into regional infrastructure projects, and this one about the government's work to improve regional airstrip safety, both taken almost completely from Anne Webster's press releases and packaged up by the MP's staffer. And it's not just happening in South Australia and Victoria. In Queensland, News Corp's Toowoomba Chronicle is at it as well, with this story about government action on doctor shortages, this story on government funding for Lifeline, and this one on a government grant for food manufacturers with almost all the content coming from press releases put out by a local coalition MP. So, is this some sort of Liberal national plot? Apparently not. Mildura Weekly editor John Dooley told the ABC last month it's because the Covid outbreak has starved them of news. Certainly we have a reasonable dependence on, on media releases, particularly where in the midst of the first outbreak with the lack of activities, you know, events being cancelled, sport being cancelled, you know, you could say that there was a little bit of drought on the local news front. It is a sorry state of affairs, but it highlights how much regional journalism is in trouble. The MEAA published a survey of 200 regional journalists last month, and more than six out of ten said resources at their paper or website were poor or very poor, while nine out of ten said the health of regional journalism has gotten worse over the past decade. And COVID has turbocharged this decline, with 66 regional news outlets closing their doors since the pandemic began, according to the Public Interest Journalism Initiative. So, times are tough, but recycling old press releases and serving them up as news will only make matters worse. And Toowoomba Chronicle editor Jordan Philp appears to accept that, telling MediaWatch... Publishing media releases as news stories is unacceptable, and I apologise to our readers. But the SE Voice editor, Lee Shell Earl, was unrepentant, telling us... We do not believe we are in any way deceiving our readers by publishing press releases as news. They are of genuine interest to our readers. Although, in relation to adding her byline to a piece where she'd written only one word, she did admit... Perhaps this was an error on our behalf. Perhaps. I think definitely is the word you're looking for. And finally to Russia, in this crazy, brave moment that flashed around the world. That is Marina Ovsyanikova, an editor on Russia's Channel One News, bursting onto its primetime 9pm bulletin and yelling, stop the war. Her banner, no war. Do not believe the propaganda. They tell you lies here. That brief protest was seen by millions because Channel One News is the most popular in Russia. And it was a remarkable act of defiance because criticising the Ukraine invasion, or calling it war, can get you thrown in jail for 15 years. But Marina's bravery did not end there. She also posted a video to Facebook attacking the Russian leader. What is currently happening in Ukraine is a crime. Russia is a country aggressor. All responsibility for this aggression lies on the conscience of one person, Vladimir Putin. Ovsyanikova's courage was hailed around the world with headlines like this. And in The Guardian, there was a bold prediction. Marina Ovsyanikova broke the state propaganda machine. Others will follow. We'll see if that turns out to be true and what punishment Ovsyanikova receives. So far, she's been interrogated for 14 hours and fined some $400 or 30,000 rubles for publishing the video. But she could still face criminal charges over the TV protest. Meanwhile, she's quit her job, turned down an offer of asylum and is fearful of what might happen. But told Reuters... No, I absolutely don't feel like a hero. I don't know. You know, I really want to feel that this sacrifice was not in vain and that people will open their eyes. I look at my mother who watches state TV presenter Vladimir Solayev and has been totally zombified by state propaganda. Zombies? You be the judge with these recent interviews on the Russian streets by Radio Free Europe. Kiev. 
Но вообще я считаю, что Путин, наверное, умный человек и знает, что делает. Как-то мне не хочется прямо это говорить, потому что у нас как-то это... может за это быть какая-то опасность. The worrying power of propaganda and an unfree press. And that's all from us tonight. There's more on our website where you can read statements from Southern Cross Austereo, the SE Voice and the Chronicle. And don't forget Media Bites every Thursday. But for now until next week, goodbye.